Okay, thank you, Steve. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm just delighted to be able to share with you uh, today. And uh, I'm like you, uh, you know, this COVID thing is bad enough, but uh, if we didn't have this technology, then uh, we would be in a lot worse shape. So at least we can see one another, uh, but it's not the same, of course, as meeting face to face and fellowshipping together. But anyway, I'm personally very thankful for the technology because I have been able to continue ministry, uh, as many of you know, on, online every week on YouTube. And I felt the Lord laid it on me to uh, present a 10 minute gospel message every week. And that's what I've been doing for the past 37 weeks. So uh, just keep praying that the, the Lord will bless his word and that people will be brought to know the Savior. Anyway, this morning, uh, I want to bring you a message from the book of Judges. And uh, we're going to read from chapter 6. Um, I spoke on this from this chapter two weeks ago down at Oak Bay on Zoom, of course. Uh, but I, the message was from the earlier parts of the chapter. But, but uh, I've been feeling so much that this story of Gideon is so relevant for the situation that we're in today because when we see, when we meet the people of Israel in this particular chapter, they were going through their own particular pandemic um, caused by the Midianites. It wasn't a disease as such, although it was caused by the disease of sin. Uh, but anyway, they were going through their own particular pandemic, and uh, we can learn some pretty powerful lessons uh, from these verses. Um, but let me say before we read, we're going to read from verse 25 down to the end of the chapter, but uh, before I do that, let me just remind you of a couple of things. Uh, first of all, the, um, the, the book of Judges is a very sad book, really. Um, it's, uh, it goes from, from bad to worse as you, as you proceed through to the various, uh, through the experience that Israel had and how God raised up the various judges to lead them and so on. But uh, there, there, there's six, um, six uh, you might say, um, six periods in their history where the same sort of cycle happens. They sin and they turn their backs on the Lord. And as a result of that, they go through a, a time of terrible spiritual poverty and suffering. And then uh, eventually they come to repentance and they seek the Lord again. And then God in mercy provides uh, one of the judges to bring deliverance to them. And that pattern is repeated six times. Uh, through the book of Judges. And uh, we're going to look at one of these passages, like these times today in the experience of Gideon. And before I read the verses too, let me just say this. Um, uh, the, the, the people of Israel were, they were being overwhelmed by the Midianites. Uh, they were going through, as I say, their own kind of pandemic. And indeed, they were, they were in their own version of lockdown because they were hiding in caves and uh, they were um, they made for themselves dens which were in the mountains and caves and strongholds because they were so scared of this the power of the enemy of the Midianites. And I also just want to say this that when you think of this, they had their their own version, their own uh, enemy, the Midianites and the Amalekites. And I would like to suggest to you that these two. Uh, the Midianites and the Amalekites suggest to us, I don't want to take it too far, but uh, the, the Midianites, the, the, the power of the enemy, the world, when it comes in, when we allow these things to happen, because all their problems stem from the fact that they turned their backs on the Lord, they began to worship other idols, and uh, the result was in terrible poverty and so on. And, and, and God used the, the Midianites to bring judgment on them. And by the way, it demonstrates for us the complete sovereignty of our God. And people, let's never lose sight of the fact that although we're in a pandemic situation today, God is still sovereign. He is Lord of the nations. He knows all about it. And um, God used these Midianites in judgment on, the, on, on that day of Gideon's day. And I sometimes wonder I've been praying about this and thinking about it quite a lot over recent weeks, that maybe this pandemic is a sign of God's judgment upon us today because we've turned our backs on him uh, big time. 
And uh, the result is that like the enemy, the Midianites overwhelmed Israel. This pandemic is overwhelming us uh, in amazing ways. Now combined with that, not only were there Midianites, but there were the Amalekites. And you might be aware of the fact that every time you read of the Amalekites in scripture, they're a, they're a picture or a type of our fleshly nature. And uh, where you get this combination of turning one's back on the Lord, compromising and, and so on, the fleshly nature takes a, a, a big part in the picture and can bring us into all kinds of problems and difficulties. And we need to be aware of these two things today. And it's a very challenging thing to remember. And um, I just believe that God's got something for, to say to us today. Um, you know, we're, when we meet Gideon, at the first time we meet him, um, he's in threshing some wheat in the wine press to hide it from the Midianites. He's in his own lockdown situation and doing his best to uh, survive under these circumstances. But, you know, people, isn't it fantastic here that uh, it says um, Israel was brought very low, it says in verse 6, because of Midianites, and the sons of Israel cried to the Lord. When people get that touch from God and begin to think about him again and turn back to God and cry out to God for mercy and, and repentance, etc., then it's an amazing thing how God works in power. And I, I, I'm sure you agree with me today, but if ever there was a day when we needed this, it's today. And I'm personally praying, and God's been putting me through some pretty deep spiritual exercises myself in the sense we need a spirit of repentance among us today. We need that we cry out to God. People cry out. The vaccine's not the answer. Because even if the vaccine drove away COVID overnight, uh, people would still turn their backs on God. The real answer is to get right with God. And um, so I, I'd like you to keep those things in mind um, when, uh, when, we're, when we're thinking about this passage. And when God begins to intervene as a result of the people crying out to him, uh, I want you to notice that... Um, it's very important to see this, that God reminds them, that he sent a prophet to them with no idea who the prophet was, but he sent this prophet, thus says the Lord, it was I who brought you up from Egypt. And he takes them right back to their initial redemption out of the land of slavery. He takes them right back to the basics. And people today, the answer today in repentance, if we come to return to the Lord, the answer is to take us right back to the cross. That's the, 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 the foundation of it all. When we come to the cross and we see our sin has been dealt with there, and that's where we get right with God. And God takes them right back to that. And he says, I delivered you. And he says in verse 9, he says, uh, I, I, I delivered you from all your oppressors and dispossessed them from before you, and I gave you their land. Now, listen, people, we as God's people today, um, we forget. We cry to God to do things. We cry to God for blessing. <clears throat> the God wants to remind us <clears throat> that if you've been to the cross and repented of your sin, <clears throat> excuse me, and you found salvation in the Lord Jesus, then God has given you the land. Amen. God has given you the land. He's given you every blessing in Christ Jesus. And that. Uh, this is our possession today, COVID or no COVID. And this is what we have to, to concentrate on. And so that's why the Lord says to Gideon when he comes to Gideon, and although he was surprised by the Lord's greeting, the Lord comes to him and says in verse 12, the Lord is with you, O valiant warrior. Now that's the last thing Gideon felt like. If it didn't feel at all like a valiant warrior, that's for sure. But God says, that's who you are. That's who you are as my child. That's who you are when, when you're right with me. And God's saying to you and me today, dear, bro, dear people, uh, you and I, the Lord is with us. Amen? Praise God for that. We need to stop looking at the circumstances. We need to focus again on the resources that are already ours in Christ. We have everything we need to, to receive and experience the almighty blessing of God in our lives. 
And so he, he tells Gideon, uh, go in this your strength and deliver Israel. Because the Lord is with you, because of what God has done for you, you can go. This is your strength. He is that to you. You've got everything you need and go in that strength. Uh, have not, have I not sent you, he says in, uh, uh, in verse 14. And, uh, and then Gideon, of course, starts to say, how can I deliver Israel? And the Lord says to him again, surely I will be with you and you shall defeat Midian as one man. That's all you need to know, Joshua. I'll be with you. And then, of course, we know in the, in the story how that Gideon went, went to, to the Lord and um, offered his gift to the Lord. And the Lord demonstrated his power by burning up this, the offering that, uh, that Gideon brought. And uh, Gideon was absolutely blown away with the fact that he suddenly realized it was God who was speaking to him after all. He really was hearing from God. And, um, and, uh, and it, says, uh, it says to him, uh, he worshiped the Lord. It's verse 24, Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and named it uh, Yahweh Shalom. The Lord is peace. To this day, it is still an offer of the Abbey Ezraites. Now, we'll come back to that in a moment, but let's say, having got the background here again, um, let's read from verse 25. It says, now, on the same night, the Lord said to, to Gideon, take your father's bull, even the second bull, seven years old, and pull down the altar of Baal, which belongs to your father, and cut down the Asherah that is beside it, and build an altar to the Lord your God on the top of the stronghold in an orderly manner. And take, take the second bull and offer a burnt offering with the wood of the Asherah, which you shall cut down. Then Gideon took 10 men of his servants and did as the Lord had spoken to him. And because he was too afraid of his father's household and the men of the city, to do it by day, he did it by night. When the men of the city arose early in the morning, behold, the altar of Baal was torn down, and the Asherah which was beside it was cut down, and uh, the, the second bull was offered on the altar which had been built. They said to one another, who did this thing? And when they searched out and inquired, they said, Gideon, the son of Joash, did this thing. Then the men of the city said to Joash, bring out your son, that he may die, for he has torn down the altar of Baal, and indeed he has cut down the Asherah which was beside it. But Joash said to all who stood against him, will you contend for Baal, or will you, del or will you deliver him? Whoever will plead for him shall be put to death by morning. If he is a god, let him contend for himself because someone else has torn down his altar. Therefore, on that day, he named him Jerubel. That is to say, let Baal contend against him, because he had torn down his altar. Then all the Midianites and the Amalekites and the sons of the east assembled themselves, and they crossed over and camped in the valley of Jezreel. So the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, and he blew a trumpet. The Abiezrites were called together to follow him, he sent messengers throughout Manasseh, and they also were called together to follow him. And he sent messengers to Asher and Zebulun and Naphtali, and they came up to meet him. Then Gideon said to God, if you will deliver Israel through me, as you have spoken, behold, I will put a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If there is dew on the fleece only, and it is dry on all the ground, then I will know that you will deliver Israel through me, as you have spoken. And it was so. When he arose early the next morning and squeezed the, the fleece, he drained the dew from the fleece, a bowl full of water. Then Gideon said to God, do not let your anger burn against me that I may speak once more. Please let me make a test once more with the fleece. Let it now be dry only on the fleece and let there be dew on all the ground. God did so that night, for it was dry only on the fleece, and the dew was all was on all the ground. Now, uh, this is a <laughs> quite a passage of scripture, and I've been so blessed in studying it again, and I'm just praying that you will be too. 
Um, so let's start with uh, where it tells us in verse 24 how that uh, after Gideon had been assured that it was the Lord who was speaking to him, how he worshipped the Lord, and um, the Lord said to him, uh, peace to you, you, you do not fear, you shall not die. And he built that altar to the Lord, named it Jehovah Yahweh Shalom, the Lord is peace. And um, <clears throat> it's a, this is quite a thing to start here, because as you know, Shalom uh, is the Hebrew word peace, and it doesn't just mean peace in the absence of war or whatever. It means wholeness or completeness. It's a very interesting word. Um, we've got a little thing just inside our front door. When you come in, it says, there's a little thing there that says shalom. And we had a tradesman come to do some work in our house one time, and it turned out he was from a Jewish background, and immediately he came in, he recognized it right away and knew exactly what it meant and what the word meant. And um, it's, so, it's such a wonderful thing. And, you know, when we think about this, can I say to you, my friends, you are today... You are complete in Christ. When we say shalom today as believers in the Lord Jesus, we're, we're expressing a wonderful truth. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians, not 2 Corinthians, Colossians 2 verse 10, that you are complete in Christ. And Paul's great burden when he wrote to the Colossian Christians uh, was that as he, he preached the gospel, as he taught the word of God, his one desire was that... Uh, that they would pre be made complete in Christ. Uh, in other words, that they would come to experience and know experientially all that was theirs in Christ. And that, I have to say to you today, is, uh, is something that's a very precious truth. In the, our pandemic today, in COVID-19, in spite of it, this is something, people, that COVID cannot touch. Let's get our eyes focused back on the Lord today. Amen. Let's realize he is our peace. He is everything that we need. And we are complete in him. And I want to say that to you today. Emphasize it. This is a fact because you know the Lord Jesus as your personal savior. Now, there are three things, therefore, from the verses that I read to you today that I really want to emphasize. And the uh, Here's what, here's what they are. Uh, first of all, that when these verses we've read, we, we find the Lord brings Gideon to a place where he, he establishes a public testimony. And that public testimony, as we'll see in a moment, was the evidence of life, evidence of his experience with God. And then after that, when you get down to about verse 33, he goes on from public testimony, which is an evidence of life, to a personal transformation, which means he was equipped for service. Personal transformation, which means he was equipped for service. And then finally, in verses 36 to 40, we have his private transaction with God, which brought um, encouragement from God. So let's look at the first one then public testimony and evidence of life from verse 25 onwards. And we find that uh, God's bringing Gideon to a, a whole new experience of God, a fresh, wonderful time as, as he meets with the Lord. And the, the first thing God challenges him with is to pull down the altar of Baal. Now notice what it says in verse 25, take your father's bull and so on, and pull down the altar of Baal, which belongs to your father, and cut down the Asherah beside it, and build an altar to the Lord your God. The, bring, pull down this altar that belongs to your father. Now, you can imagine that Gideon, for many years maybe, had been influenced by what his father had uh, decided to take, the action his father took in building an altar to Baal, etc., etc. But I think what we need to understand here. Uh, God is, first of all, delivering Gideon from past stuff <clears throat> that had been a tremendous hindrance to him as far as knowing God was concerned. Uh, God says, pull down this altar that belonged to your father. Now, can I say to you people and remind you that when you became a Christian and you trusted Christ as your savior, 
you became a completely new person. You became a completely new person. Uh, if anyone is in Christ, that person is a new creature, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 and following. Old has gone, the new has come. Do you remember when, um, when Zacchaeus climbed the tree to, to see Jesus and, uh, and then the Lord said to him, come down, I want to come to your house today. And he said, and how uh, Zacchaeus was willing to get rid of all the stuff that he had in his life, all the stuff that had been a big hindrance to him. He said, the half of my goods I'm giving to the poor. If I've, um, if I've robbed anybody, I'll pay them back four times as much. And so on. the Lord Jesus says, today salvation has come to this house. And um, people, this is a, a very important thing for us. I want to ask you today, I challenge myself, do you have any idols you need to pull down? Do you have any idols? What is the, num the thing in your life that you would say was the number one hindrance to you having a vital a living, joyous, peace, uh, peaceful experience of God every day. Do you need to pull down idols? I want to. I have to tell you, God's dealt with me in the past and brought me to a place where I need to destroy idols, get rid of the stuff that is hindering us in our walk with God. Get rid of the stuff, people, that is a barrier to the church having an impact on our world today. And I want to say this, after the Lord said to Gideon, pull down that altar of Baal, he then went on in, um, in verse 26, and he said to him, um, he said, uh, and build an altar to the Lord, your God. Now, this, is, this was your father's God. You're pulling that down. Now build an altar to the Lord, your God. I've met with you, Gideon, that, that the Lord, your God. And I want to say to you people that, um, uh, that, that Gideon was coming to the place where realizing his, in this relationship with God, there's nothing secondhand about it. There's nothing secondhand about it. And um, I, I just feel, I feel very burdened about this. Um, in, in verse 29 and 31, we're, we're made, it's made, made clear that old dead idols can do nothing for us. I want this, I'd love to challenge a, a lot of people, the this, this stuff in their lives that they've put such emphasis on uh, before COVID. I'd like to ask them, what, what good is it doing you now? What good is it doing you now? Uh, it does no good at all. You, it's just stuff. And people, I want us to, I'd love us. And I, I mean, I, my heart aches for uh, what's going on in the church today and for our assemblies and so on. And I believe that one of the biggest problems in our assemblies today, and one of the reasons why we are, we're in, I might say, in a kind of spiritual lockdown, we're in our little groups and we're, and praise God for each other. Don't get me wrong, folks, but I, I need to say to you today that there's a big danger of, of our experience being secondhand. I thank God for my heritage in the assemblies when I was a boy and growing up in Scotland. But I, I thank God more than ever that God brought me to my own experience of God. Amen. When God taught me to debunk stuff and, with, and, and got me away from relying on other people's faith and coming to God and saying, God, what do you want to do today? And I believe as, as assemblies today and as the people of God, were we to humble ourselves before him and repent of the stuff. And, and come to the Lord and say, God, we want to build an altar to our own God. We want, we want to know you for ourselves. Thank God for our parents and past generations that pointed us to the Lord. But now we want to make sure that our experience of God is our own and it's real. And he, he, brought, he built that altar and he, he offered that burnt offering. And, uh, and it, 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 the, the burnt offering, of course, um, uh, he burned, he, he made that offering, and um, it, it tells us the burnt offering, as you know, is the offering that where every every part of it was for the Lord. Every part of it. You remember when Abraham offered up the the, the ram in in the place of Isaac? It was a burnt offering. It, it the whole thing went out to God. It was a sweet aroma to the Lord. That's what God says about the burnt offering in the in the Old Testament. And we could get, say a lot of things about that. Um, and uh, we, we're told in Ephesians chapter 5, 
for example, in the New Testament, if I might just read a verse there uh, with you just now, in Ephesians 5, it says, talking about the Lord Jesus, um, to be imitators of God as beloved children, walk in love just as Christ also loved, loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. Jesus was the perfect answer. People, he's he is your savior. He's my savior. There's nothing. God never wants us to be a, a living a second-hand kind of experience. And I want to say to you today: May God, in this day that we are living in, may God bring us to that place where we long, we yearn, we'll make do anything God wants us to do in order that our experience of Him will be new, fresh, vital, and we know for sure that He is our own Lord. We're not living in the past. So that was for Gideon, this new relation, this new experience of God and being used of God. It began when he come to, comes to this place of uh, public testimony. Um, the, the, this place of public testimony where he pulls down the altar of Baal and, and he makes a new start, if you like. And, um, and, and this was, this was, this is, so vital for all of us, so vital, um, because when we are hiding our faith, when we are um, kind of in lockdown spiritually, um, I, and I'm not saying we start disobeying the rules re-COVID, not for one minute, but I'm saying when we're in lockdown spiritually and as believers, we're hiding in our, our churches or we're hiding our light under a bushel, so to speak, then we need to examine our hearts about all of that stuff. And um, when you find that he, he built that altar, and he, he um, but it says he, he did it by night because he was afraid, it tells us. Now, I, I'd have been thinking about this, you know, and I can understand why he was afraid. This was a big deal. And when you and I nail our colors to the mast, as we used to say, uh, and we go public with our testimony and we fearlessly witness for Jesus, it's a big deal. It's a challenging thing. You'll be laughed at, you'll be mocked, you'll be all kinds of things. Uh, but this, this is what Gideon did. He did it by night. But on the other hand, it was such a big deal that it had to be done. Just imagine if you had done it by day, then the, the, there would have been all kinds of people doing all kinds of things to hinder him, uh, doing what God asked him to do. But that idol of, to Baal, that altar to Baal had to go. It had to go. And so he did it by night. And whatever people, if God's challenging you or me to get rid of idols, it's, it's such a vital thing. We need to, um, we need to do it on a, a personal level between us and God. It has to be done thoroughly and properly so that we really have repented of whatever's a hindrance in our lives. And we really have surrendered everything to the Lord. And we've built an altar to him. And he is Lord in our lives beyond a shadow of a doubt. So when that public testimony was established and Gideon got this thing right, then we move on and we find out that because of this personal transformation, he was now equipped for service. And when you uh, come down here now from verse 33 onwards, um, um, he comes down to verse 33, and, and the first thing we read is that the Midianites and the Amalekites assembled themselves. The old problem was still there, okay? The devil's not going to go anywhere until, uh, until the Lord banishes him uh, in uh, the thousand years reign and so on. The, 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 the old enemy is always going to be there, and when you surrender your life to Jesus, you're going to experience the old enemy just a, as much as ever, in fact, maybe more so. And um, But the point is this, that uh, it, Gideon was now equipped for service. The old challenge was there. Um, and uh, the, the, we go back to verse six of, of, of verse three of chapter six, um, the Midianites, the Amalekites, it was all the whole problem was there as, as, as before. Now, let me say this to you here. That, and we sung a verse in one of the songs we sang this morning that, that just says this very thing, <clears throat> that when, we're, when we're, uh, we're not prepared to go on with God, when we're not to prepared to take God at his word and be totally obedient to the Lord, 
totally obedient. This is the key to it all, moving in obedience step by step. When we're not prepared to do that, then unbelief always, always, always results in spiritual paralysis. It always results in spiritual paralysis. When you and I move in obedience to the Lord, then we're going to see the power of God demonstrated in us. We're going to be absolutely blown away. And I mean that with what God will do in our lives when we're prepared to be obedient. I've just, I got a book for Christmas that I finished reading a week or so ago. And it's, uh, it's uh, it was, the title is Becoming Elizabeth Elliot. It's a new biography of the late Elizabeth Elliot, whose husband Jim was one of the martyrs in Ecuador back in 1956. And at that time, that whole thing made a huge impact on me as a young Christian. And reading this book of Elizabeth Elliot and all she went through and how she went back to that tribe of Indians in, in Ecuador and some, many of them came to the Lord, etc. Uh, the, the thing that came through to me in the book was her obedience to the Lord. It cost her everything. And yet she was prepared to move in obedience to whatever God called her to do. And that was the key to the whole business. Um, we need to get that principle in our minds. The old challenges will be there. But what made the difference was in verse 34, the spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. It means Gideon was clothed by the Holy Spirit. And people, you don't need me to tell you that if we're going to do anything for the glory of God, if we're going to do spiritual work, it will only be done by spiritual power not by how clever we are, not by how much money we've got, nothing like that at all, only by spiritual power, only in the power of the Holy Spirit, not in the energy of the flesh. And that is key to this whole business. You remember in the book of Acts, praise God for this, amen, when the Lord, Lord the risen Lord had ascended back to heaven in chapter two and the fulfillment of Joel's prophecy, the Holy Spirit was poured out upon all flesh. And, um, the, 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 in, in Acts 2, it, in, the, in Peter's message on that, uh, that day of Pentecost, uh, if I might just get this, this verse and, and read it to you, in Acts 2, verse 38, um, where it says, uh, Peter said to them, Repent, each of you, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Can I ask you, beloved, how real is that for you today? Is that are we rejoicing in that today that you and I have repented of our sin? We've repented of it. We've turned our back upon it. We've, we've, we've acknowledged our sinfulness before God. We've trusted Christ. And the moment we do that, the moment we do that, then um, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I want to remind you today that the Holy Spirit, if you're a believer in Jesus, is living on the inside of you. The question is now is, are you or are you not? Am I or am I not filled with the Holy Spirit? Because again, back over in, in Ephesians um, uh, chapter 5, and down about uh, verse 15 and following, where Paul's telling them to make uh, walk not as unwise, but walk as wise men and women, making the most of your time, because the days are evil. Now, you don't need me to tell you people that was never more true than it is today. That's what we're living in right now. The days are evil. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation. But what? What's the answer? Be filled with the Spirit. And the word is ever be filled. Every day of your life, be filled with the Spirit. Uh, and so on. And, and that's the challenge for me today. And I want to say to you again, people, uh, are, am I, are you filled with the Holy Spirit today? If we're not, why not? Jesus said, if you know, uh, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? And uh, I don't know about you, but it's a, a regular exercise of mine to succumb to the Lord and say, God, my only plea in your presence is the precious blood of Jesus. Take away everything that grieves your spirit and fill me afresh fill me anew today and how wonderful is that people that Gideon was clothed with the Holy Spirit and um, what because of that he was the new leader now notice verse 34 it says the spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon and what was the result 
Did he cower and go, go into a cave somewhere? No, he blew the trumpet and the Abiyazrites were called together. You don't get more public than that. He went public with his faith. He was willing to, to, to tell the world that he, he, of the transaction that had just happened between him and the Lord. So you can see the, the progression here, I hope, uh, from that public testimony being established, destroying the idols, building an idol to the Lord. So he knew the Lord was his own Lord, not he was not living in a second-hand experience. And that moving on to this personal transformation, being clothed with the Holy Spirit. And for you and I, we're not clothed with the Holy Spirit. We're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. We can be filled with the Holy Spirit, which is so much more amazing and wonderful. And then as a result of all of that, um, you come to the third point that this private transaction, which resulted in encouragement from God, from verse uh, 36 down to verse 40. And this is a very interesting place. Now, he, the crunch, he came to the crunch now. He blew the trumpet, and, and now he, the, the crunch came. We're going against the, the, the Midianites and the Amalekites. And you remember in the early, the early verses of the chapter, they were like locusts on the ground. There were so many of them. It was huge. Talk about pandemic proportions. It was huge. This was overwhelming, humanly speaking. And, uh, and yet, this was, the, this was the situation. And he comes to the Lord. And I, I, I love this. I really do love this. Gideon's heart before God and God's heart for Gideon. Um, it says there in verses 36, he came to the Lord. And we know the story here about the fleece. The whole I put a, a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. I've been interested in thinking about this fleece thing. Uh, and, and Gideon says, we want to see dew on the fleece and nowhere else. And then the second time we want dew on the ground and not on the fleece. And in the scriptures, when you read about dew, you're reading about the blessing of the Lord. It's a beautiful picture of the blessing of God. You go to Psalm 133 and you'll find it there. The blessing of the Lord, it's like the dew that God uh, gives each new day. Um, but anyway, um, you find here uh, the spirit-filled man, the man who's clothed in the Holy Spirit, uh, his desire was for God's blessing. Amen? That was his, he'd come to that place that all he wanted more than anything in the world was the blessing of the Lord on what he was going to do. And so he comes to God, he pours out his heart and said, Lord, I want to be really, really sure about this. I want to be really sure. I don't want to do anything that is contrary to your will. I don't want to do this. I mean, you think about it. Uh, if Gideon was going to go against the, the Midianites and he had gone in his own strength and he, he won the victory, think about what he would have to crow about. The whole point in the rest of the story is that God dealt with Gideon so that he would have nothing whatsoever to crow about. He and everybody else would would be uh, um, left in no doubt that the result was the work of God and nothing else. Only It was only God's work. And so he comes to the Lord with this honesty and this humble attitude. Lord, I don't want to do anything in my strength. I want to know, Lord, is this really you? I want a final confirmation, Lord. And, and that was Gideon's heart. And then you come to the very last bit in the, in the passage and... Uh, it says that um, God, God did so that night, but it was dry only on the fleece and the dew on all the ground. Uh, God did so. You find here not only Gideon's heart in coming to God with this request, but God's heart in desiring above all things to bless Gideon. God's heart for Gideon was that he would not miss anything and that he would experience all that God had said he would. God said to him, you go my way, Gideon, and I will destroy the Midianites. I'll deal with those guys. I'll take away their power. I'll, do, I'll deal with them. I was really blessed just the other day in listening to a message uh, about uh, Caleb when he said to Joshua, give me this mountain, the Mount Horeb. And uh, the, the thought in that passage is uh, that God, God had shown Caleb, and Caleb was able to say in faith, the Lord has taken away the power of the enemy, the giants, every obstacle. The Lord's taken away their power. And uh, God, God was so wanting to bless Gideon and uh, to show him 
that he, the promise God had made, I will destroy the Midianites. Here's their confirmation. You keep going, Gideon, be obedient, and I'll show you what I will do. Now, when this, when we think about this um, thing about putting out fleeces, uh, I'd just like to say something to maybe some of the younger people here. Um, you know, when you're maybe feeling called to do something and call, God's called to do something in your life, or uh, uh, how do you know, how do you really know for sure it's in the will of God? Do you put out a fleece um, asking the Lord for certain things to just demonstrate that you are in the will of God? Well, maybe there's something to be said for that. But I would like to share with you what's been my experience over the years. And that is there are three things that we need to keep in mind. And I believe this is our fleece today. Number one, if God's really working in your life, you will know that that is the case. There will be the witness of his spirit in your heart, sensing deeply that God's asking you to do something, sensing deeply that he is, and that you're sensing God's leading you in a certain direction. The second thing is this, that um, not only will that be that witness of your, the spirit in your heart, but that witness will be confirmed by the word of God. It will be, God will never ask you to do anything that's contrary to his word. That is the final test. And that's why it is absolutely essential that as the people of God, we be in the word every day, soaking ourselves in it and seeking the will of God with a desire to be obedient. As it says in Deuteronomy, a verse there, God said to his people, listen obediently, listen obediently. And uh, when we want to be obedient to the Lord, then as we seek his word, God, I believe, will confirm um, his word to our hearts. He, he really will do that. Um, and, and then the third thing is this, uh, there will be uh, the, getting wisdom and advice from, from God's people who really know us, maybe elders in our, our, our church or uh, mature believers who know us well and who will be prepared to be absolutely honest with us as we go and share with them what's in our hearts, when we go and share what God seems to be saying through his word and finding confirmation uh, with them. Um, I'm sorry, there's finding confirmation in his word. And that's, uh, um, uh, uh, when these three things come together, is, it's a beautiful thing, I believe, to, to, that we're walking in the will of the Lord. And I have to say to you, I'll never forget when I was a young guy going to my elders, I was feeling that, uh, that God had, uh, was calling me to the ministry of evangelism and to leave my job in the bank and, and launch out in evangelism and God then, that, that was the number one thing. And then God spoke to me through his word, that scripture of the, of the, uh, the Hebrew servant, uh, where um, the, the, uh, the servant was to say, I love my master, my wife, my children. I will not go out free. And he was going to have his ear bored through with an awl, and he would serve his master permanently. And God really spoke to me through that scripture. And then I went to my own local elders and shared what was going on. And then it really, oh boy, what an encouragement. They said to me, Clayton, we've just been waiting for this. We've just been waiting for this. And it was such a huge confirmation to me. And I can tell you, then we could launch out and move ahead in, with the peace of God in our hearts. So people today, here we are. That's about the end of my message today. But... <laughs> Uh, just to say that I really feel God laid this on my heart. We're living in very difficult days, no question about that. But oh, bless God today, we have the resources in God that, because we know Jesus. And as we keep focused on him, and I, I pray God that you and I will all will have a Gideon experience in this COVID crisis. And uh, the, oh, would to God that the whole church would come before the Lord, would to God that his people would humble, we would all humble ourselves and seek him and pray and know God and repent of our sin and know God uh, healing our land. Only God can really heal our land. Um, and he is well able to do that. And you know, I've had people, I've told you guys before, an assembly we were in in Scotland when I was young, we experienced genuine revival. 
And so when you talk to people about revival, sometimes they say, well, it doesn't last, does it? It doesn't last. And you know why that is? There's a very simple reason why it doesn't last. Because the Amalekites are always there. And our fleshly nature is always there. And it, our fleshly nature would seek to draw us away from what God is doing. And we need to be so vigilant when it comes to stuff like that. So that we continue in God's will and with God's blessing. I hope you're encouraged today, dear people. If somebody's listening to me, I don't know, who's never known the Lord Jesus, I want to tell you there is nothing in the world that comes anywhere close to uh, knowing Jesus as your personal Savior. And that can be yours through repenting of sin today, realizing that Jesus took your place on that cross. He took the judgment for your sin, and he wants to, um, he wants to make you a new person to cleanse you, give, fill you with his peace. Uh, what a tremendous thing. I've got permission to share this with you. Uh, actually, some of you guys at Westview will remember Steve Renton. And uh, Steve Renton came to me a few weeks ago and uh, was had no assurance of his salvation. But I want to tell you, if you talk to Steve today, God's done a number in that guy's life. No question about it. He came in my presence. He repented of sin. He got right with God. He came into real assurance. And Steve is just full of it today, absolutely full of it. I saw him, saw him just a few days ago, and it's wonderful to see. People, when you know Jesus, there's no end to what God wants to do in you and through you. So, and if we are believers today, let's take this word from the Lord, and let's be humble before him, and be honest before him, and really seek God individually, and as a fellowship of his people, uh, that God would have his way in us and through us for the glory of his name. Amen. Let's pray together, shall we? Lord, we humbly bow in your presence today. Lord, we so need your touch. We so need your blessing. Lord, and these are trying days for all of us. But oh, how we worship you, God, how we worship you today. You are Lord over the Midianites. You're Lord over the Amalekites. You're Lord over COVID-19. You're Lord over men and women in high places who would want to do damage in our world today. God, you are Lord. You're Lord of the nations, and we worship you. And God, I just pray that as individuals and as groups of your people, Lord, we will be right with you, filled with your spirit, God, ready, willing to move forward, having pull, pulled down all the idols, destroyed them utterly and completely, and 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 allow Jesus to be Lord in our hearts and in our lives. God bless your word today, we humbly pray. Thank you for this opportunity of being together. We give you all praise and glory in Jesus' name, amen. amen.